How does a man with no ID and no transportation get from upstate New York to Northern California? It's more than 4,500 kilometers as the crow flies, but that is the mystery officials are trying to solve after a missing Toronto firefighter turned up in Sacramento six days after disappearing while skiing near Lake Placid. On Wednesday, the 7th of February 2018, 49-year-old Toronto firefighter Constantinos Philippidis, or Danny as he is known, is skiing at Whiteface Mountain in Wilmington, New York, as part of an annual ski trip with off-duty and retired firefighters. The married father of two is considered to be an intermediate skier, along with the eight others who joined him on vacation. It's the last day of their trip before they return home from Whiteface Mountain, one of the highest peaks in the Adirondacks, covered in ski trails, wooded areas, trees and rocks. At around 2.30pm, one of the group mentions that they feel fatigued and want to leave, but Philippidus wants to have one last attempt down the mountain, so continues off alone for a final run. As his friends wait for him at the lodge, Situated halfway down the mountain, a strong snowstorm hits, leading to poor visibility in the area. Around an hour and a half later, at 4pm, the ski lifts close for the day, and Philippidus is nowhere to be seen. His friends wait a further 30 minutes before beginning to worry for his well-being, and at 4.30pm, they report him missing. They go to check at the resort where they were staying, to see if he may have gone back, only to find his car, passport, phone and ID exactly where he had left them earlier that day. A search quickly begins for Philippidus on the mountain, as forest rangers, ski patrol and other skiers scour the slopes to look for the missing firefighter. As the evening draws darker, the weather conditions worsen, and despite their best efforts, Philippidus is nowhere to be found. The following day, more people join the search, including New York State Police, Homeland Security, US border officials and other volunteers. When news hits home about their missing colleague, over 100 Toronto firefighters travel to Lake Placid to help with the search, with an equal number of their colleagues agreeing to backfill their shifts. Helicopters, drones and sniffer dogs are all deployed to the mountain to look for Philippidus, who was last seen wearing a green ski jacket, black helmet, goggles and red skis. Over the next six days, around 6,000 people in total helped search for Philippidus, including his wife who travelled down to Lake Placid to help with the rescue efforts, and as days passed by, the hope that Philippidus would be found alive began to fade. However, almost a week after going missing in New York, and against all the odds, Philippidus is found alive, over four and a half thousand kilometres away in California. At 9.30am on Tuesday the 13th of February, Philippidus' wife is meeting the search party in Lake Placid when she gets a phone call from an unknown number. As she answers, she hears her nickname from the voice of her lost husband and recognises it immediately. He tells her that he's on his own at Sacramento Airport in California, approximately four and a half thousand kilometres east and on the other side of the country. She informs him to get help as soon as possible, so he hangs up and calls 911 to tell police he is a missing person. When they arrive, shortly after making contact, police find Philippidus at the airport's car rental terminal, still wearing the ski clothes he had on when he went missing six days prior in New York, including the jacket, boots, and even carrying the ski helmet. 
Reports say that Philippidus was found in a disoriented state. So much so, that when he was asked to describe a blue sign, he said that it was green, and he didn't know what day it was. Along with the skiing attire, he was also found carrying a newly purchased iPhone, a credit card, $1,000 in cash, and had managed at some point to get a haircut. When initially asked how he got to Sacramento from New York, he told deputies he thinks he may have suffered a head injury as his memory was cloudy, but he remembered riding as a passenger in a big rig style truck and that he slept a lot. Other than that, he claims he didn't remember anything else and apparently didn't even know how he obtained a new phone to call his wife. He was immediately taken to hospital to be assessed for possible head trauma, but was later discharged with no reported signs of any injuries. According to Sergeant Sean Hampton of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department, officers spoke with Philippides for some time and were confident he was not impaired by drugs or alcohol. They believed that Philippides was dropped off at Sacramento the night prior to him calling them, and that he must have slept on the streets near Richards Boulevard, along the Interstate 5 corridor, based on what he told them. They were unclear how Philippides got to Sacramento Airport the next day, but it's assumed that he may have got a taxi there before calling his wife. After the news of his discovery on the other side of the country, the press began trying to piece together the story, and Frank Ramagnano, president of the Toronto Professional Firefighters Association, answered questions on what he knew. Apparently he was uh, confused, he wasn't uh, able to give uh, uh, direct answers. Uh, they were the police that eventually made contact with him were concerned and brought him to uh, get some medical attention. Can you tell us how he made contact with his wife? He had phoned. Um, he had uh, called her by a nickname. She quickly recognized the voice and that it was him. Uh, then they lost contact. He contacted her again and uh, they kept him on the phone and asked him to call 911 to get him help as soon as possible. Where was he at that point? I know it's uh, somewhere near Sacramento, California. Um, I, I'm, I'm told that he still had the same clothing that he was skiing in and uh, the authorities seem to indicate that it looked like uh, he had been in those clothes for since he's been missing. Uh, there was, I believe, about eight of them skiing. He had been skiing with someone who was feeling fatigued. Uh, the person he was skiing with wanted to take a break. It was coming to uh, the end of the day and Danny, uh, Danny uh, wanted to do a, a last run. So he was skiing by himself when he went missing. Further statements were made in the following days by New York and Sacramento authorities, with police distributing a picture taken of Philippides when he was discovered, in the hopes that anyone who recognizes him can come forward with information on what may have happened. After a few days, Philippides returned to the Adirondacks for police questioning before finally returning home to Toronto with his family and continuing his work as a captain with the Toronto Fire Services. Police appealed for the supposed truck driver that took Philippides on his six day journey to get in touch. But to this day, nobody has come forward with any new information. Speculation grew on what could have happened to the firefighter that week, and people would have to wait a further six months before hearing from Philippides himself on his version of events. I'm still shocked. Like, I, I mean, I'm back to work, I feel great. But, you know, you forget about it for a few days and then someone or something jogs your memory and then you, you think back at it and it's still... Uh, still overwhelmingly like, shocking to like that it happened. It was someone determined that I was probably on the kids hill. Uh, I must have made a wrong turn but somehow that's where I was. I wasn't uh, in a high level mountain area or I was pretty well near the bottom of the hill. I didn't make it to the main lodge um, because I think I, I, had, I headed towards the car which is adjacent to the lodge and then with my vehicle not there um, it really got a little overwhelming and, um, and I think that's when I'm assuming, you know, I hailed uh, or 
you know, put my arm up or something like that, just to hail a ride um, back into town. It was a truck. Okay. Um, like a transport? Like a transport. Okay. And um, I don't know if I said anything. I don't really recall having, uh, I'm just assuming that I hailed a ride and I'm not certain if I said anything, but I would assume that I must have said, you know, to get a ride or something. The doctor says, you know, I think you had a severe head injury and uh, it was temporary and uh, everything's going to be normal for you moving forward. So there is a lot to unpack here. And before we go into the theories of what happened, we need to recap on the timeline of events, as there are a number of inconsistencies with this story that makes the whole thing even weirder than it already is. I've scrolled through countless articles and videos to try and best discover the truth in what happened here, but the more I learn about this case, the more confusing it becomes. Let's go down the rabbit hole together and explore the disappearance of Danny Philippidus. So to recap, on Wednesday the 7th of February, Philippidus is spending the last day of his ski trip with friends on Whiteface Mountain. At 2.30pm, one of the other skiers mentions that they feel fatigued and want to leave. So Philippidus goes for one final run on the slope. Now let's pause here, as we're already at our first discrepancy. When the news first broke, even Frank Ramagnano stated in press conferences that this was the scenario which led to the disappearance. Uh, the person he was skiing with wanted to take a break. It was coming to uh, the end of the day and Danny, uh, Danny uh, wanted to do uh, a last run. Assuming this is what his friends would have told authorities when he initially went missing, it's strange to see that this story somewhat changes in later months. After his interview with Michelle McQuigg later that year, it's instead reported that Philippidus had forgotten to bring a camera to the lodge where he was unwinding with friends, about halfway up the mountain, so he told them he would ski down to his car to retrieve his phone to take some pictures before the end of the trip. At first, this may seem like a small detail, but in every article or report during the days he was missing, the original story never mentioned that Philippidus was going to his vehicle to retrieve a phone. Without extensive knowledge of the mountain itself, I would imagine that his car would have been parked in one of these six parking lots, whilst the lodge he left his friends at, which is described as being halfway up the mountain, would be this one here. Assuming something happened to Philippidus during his ski down, that would leave a likely search area of anywhere below the lodge. It may seem like a small detail to get wrong, but it's these small details that matter when searching for a missing person. Philippidus then states in the interview that he believes he must have taken a wrong turn on his way to the car, and lost consciousness some time shortly after splitting up with the others. Upon coming to, he made his way to what he mistakenly believed to be the main ski lodge, only to find it closed and deserted. It was later determined that Philippidus likely fell near the children's ski slope and made his way to the hub of kids programming, an area that's sparsely populated and would have been closed at the time. Still dazed and confused as to where he was, and unable to find his car, Philippidus claims he hailed down a truck to get a ride back into town, climbed into the cabin area, and began moving away from the mountain. Philippidus claims he remembers vague moments of consciousness whilst on the journey, such as being sick by the side of the road of what appeared to be a truck stop and learning that he was driving through Utah. He remembers a crushing headache and intense fatigue that left him unable to do little besides sleep as he made his way further east. Towards the end of the journey, the unnamed trucker informed Philippidus that they had reached the end of the line in Sacramento before dropping him off and leaving. Philippidus states that he had no idea who the driver was or what they spoke about but that he did recall that he had a generic name which he gave to authorities. The identity of this driver is to this day unknown. The truck journey itself presents a lot more questions. For now, let's assume that Philippidus's cognitive state 
was so impaired that the actions he took by boarding a random truck for help are plausible. If he was so visibly disoriented and tired, why didn't the driver seek help for Philippidus and drive him to the nearest hospital or to local authorities? Even if Philippidus had told the driver that he needed a ride all the way to Sacramento, surely a reasonable person would see that this wasn't a normal request for a man in ski gear and no belongings. I find it bizarre that anyone would carry this out, but we unfortunately don't know what Philippidus told the driver, so can't make assumptions on how this journey came to be. Upon reaching downtown Sacramento, after being missing for five days and with only a credit card and no ID, Philippidus decided that he needed to find a way to contact his wife. With his phone still back in New York, it's reported that he took out $1,000 in cash from the credit card in order to buy himself a new iPhone. However, this report suggests that the Firefighters Association claimed that none of his bank cards were used whilst he was missing, although I'm willing to accept that this detail may have been later confirmed. If true, however, why did it not flag to police that a transaction had been made in Sacramento the day before Philippidus contacted them? Also, if he wished to contact his wife, why did he not use a payphone or ask a passerby for help? Why go through all the trouble of purchasing a new device, which according to Philippidus was a struggle as some vendors wouldn't even sell to him without a valid ID? After purchasing the phone, Philippidus then claims that he couldn't immediately remember his wife's number, but instead searched Whiteface Mountain online where he realized that he was a missing person. At this point, rather than calling 911 or heading straight to a police station for immediate help, he instead decided to sleep on the streets overnight near Richards Boulevard. The next morning, on Tuesday the 13th of February, Philippidus, still in his ski clothing, decided to get a ride to Sacramento Airport and it's at this point where he finally remembers his wife's number. He makes contact with her, she tells him to call 911 and the police arrive to find Philippidus at the rental car terminal of the airport. And remember, at some point between leaving the truck and contacting the police, Philippidus decided to get a haircut. The whole story from start to finish is truly bizarre and one that has a frustrating amount of unanswered questions and logical fallacies. It's only when we get into the possible theories of what caused Philippidus's memory loss that we can perhaps begin to understand the events that unfolded. Medical experts believe that Philippidus's memory loss and choice of actions could be caused by one of two things. The first theory, posed by Dr. Charles Tater, a Toronto brain surgeon, is that Philippidus suffered from amnesia resulting from a concussion. He believes that the incident could be a combination of retrograde amnesia, which is the loss of memory before a blow to the head, and anterograde amnesia, the loss of memory after a blow to the head. If Philippidus sustained a significant head injury on his way down the slope, it's possible that the following concussion could cause a loss of memory, which can last anywhere from a few seconds to 24 or 48 hours in length. This theory wouldn't account for the whole of Philippidus' memory loss, however, with Dr. Tater himself quoted as saying that his days-long episode was unusual. The second theory, posed by Dr. Jennifer Ryan, a senior scientist at the Rotman Research Institute at Baycrest in Toronto, is that Philippidus experienced another form of amnesia, a dissociative fugue state. A fugue being the Latin term for flight, is a rare condition which can be triggered by the likes of a head injury, but it could also be sparked by a traumatic event or emotional disturbance. People with dissociative fugue temporarily lose their sense of personal identity and impulsively wander or travel away from their usual surroundings. They often become confused about who they are and might even create new identities. Outwardly, People with this disorder show no signs of illness or injury, but for whatever reason, their normal behavior changes and they have difficulty remembering who or where they are. Dr. Ryan states that subjects typically don't remember the traveling itself. 
Their memory frequently kicks in when they find themselves in a new, unfamiliar location. The problem with amnesic episodes like this is that some subjects never fully recover these lost moments, leaving them with islands of memory that remain lost forever. This may be the case with Philippidus, and therefore we may never learn of some of the missing pieces to the puzzle unless those fragments of memory return. It's possible then that Philippidus experienced one of these two conditions, leading to his cross-country disappearance, although there are others who speculate otherwise. Frustratingly, it's likely that we'll never know the full story of what happened to Danny Philippidus during that winter week, but I think it's important to recognise how fortunate we are to have a happy ending to this case. Many people who go missing in circumstances such as these end up lost forever, or worse. So it's important that we recognise that despite his misadventures, there is a happy ending for Philippidus and his family. We can almost talk about anything now, in a sense that, um, I mean, I was close to them before, um, but even closer now. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please leave a like, and if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel if you're interested in more videos like this. What do you think happened to Danny Philippidis? Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts are. I just want to say a massive thank you to my patrons and also to Ripley Sterling who helped once again with the music for this video. If you've got any suggestions on future stories you want me to cover, feel free to leave a comment below or just email me, there's a link on my channel. Thanks again for watching, I'll see you on the next one.